let's, let's go to work here. Listen, we've come to the end of this part of our journey, a journey to rightly divide the scriptures and work with them so that we might draw closer to God and live our lives asking, seeking, knocking, not sitting in our armchairs, assured that we have found everything and nothing else is necessary, but rather continuing the work, the work of Scripture. Now, we've learned. We've learned that God and our book are not the same thing, that the Bible has marks of humanity all over it in its writing, in its editing, and in its translation and its transmission. Should we be afraid? Have we lost our map, our GPS? Have we moved from certainty to a confused state of uncertainty? Have we, have we lost our pacifier and now have no access to solid food? Well, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in Jesus. That's exactly what Jesus told the apostles. Now remember, he started his ministry by saying, you've heard it said, and quoting from the old scriptures, and then saying, but I say to you. He had rattled their cages an awful lot, and he had just told them that all of their dreams and plans were not going to happen. In fact, none of them were. Because all of these times, they, they had been so certain and so had all of their teachers, priests, scribes, family leaders, that God was sending a king to reestablish Israel's boundaries, their borders, the kingdom, and that it would be mighty and no, no kingdom could ever, could ever swallow them again. And Jesus said, no. No, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. And my kingdom is not of this world. We cannot overstate how shaken they would have been. I'm aware that in some of these lessons that I've rattled a few cages, or as I often, Cammie will say, how did it go? And I'll say, well, I kicked open doors and knocked over the trash cans. And that's, that's just my way of saying, they asked me to come. <laughs> they knew who, I, who, who, had, who was coming. And we needed to do some repair work around them. But we had to deconstruct before we could construct. And that's always painful. But it's nothing compared to what they went through when Jesus told them, no, those aren't going to happen. That's not the plan. What path forward would they have? What would they believe in? Then we read the Psalms. Do you read the Psalms? If you do, and, and you should, the Psalms are there for us. God gave us a songbook. He gave us a theological book as well. It was, in the words of Philip Yancey, the Bible Jesus read. It was what they quoted. It, is how, it had worked their way into their lives. I would recommend that you read one at a time and you give time to it. Because if you just keep reading, it's like going to Proverbs. There's no one theme. Every verse is a new discrete thing. And I, I used to not like Psalms at all because to me it was schizophrenic. It, it would say, oh, Lord, you are wonderful. You are wonderful. Where are you, Lord? You're hurting us, Lord. And then, Lord, go kill those people. And then, you know, I, I would always going, I don't know what, what's going on here. Well, we read the Psalms, and over one-third of them are Psalms of disorientation, confusion, complaint, loss, uncertainty. One-third. I don't think we deal with that fact enough. The God-given songbook and theology book to the Hebrew people, one-third of it was about being disoriented and not seeing the face of God, not hearing his voice, not feeling the spirit. So what's going on here? Well, God does answer that question. At the baptism of Jesus, God shows up and goes, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And later at the transfiguration, as we discussed last week, he goes, listen to him. This is the son of God. Look at him. Listen to him. So our response to our journey of the last 11 weeks is to burrow ourselves into the gospels. Live them. I get emails every week from people who have lost their faith, people who are trying to find their faith, people who found their faith that have questions, and, and I try to answer all of them. If you've sent an email to us and we've not answered you in a couple of weeks, that means we didn't get it or we forgot. 
we want to answer all of them. So remind us. Reminding us is not nagging us. We're happy to listen. It's info at oursafeharbor.com. But we bur- one of the, the emails I got was of a fellow who's lost his faith. And my response to him was not, well, here are the evidences. Instead, I said, while we're talking, I want to see if you'll do something. I understand I have no moral authority over you. I have no authority of any kind over you. But would you just read the Gospels for the next six months? Over and over. Now, this is a fellow who's well acquainted with the Gospels. And I go, I know, I know. I was too. Until I read them over and over for six months. Then I realized, no, I wasn't acquainted with this. And it puts a different light on things. Will that bring him back to faith? Here's the thing. That's not my goal. My goal is just to show him Jesus. We're going to let the Spirit do what the Spirit does. I don't plan to drag anybody across any line because I trust God and I trust God's provision and his salvation and his grace. But if you burrow into the Gospels, you just soak in his words, his actions, his attitudes. He keeps us not oriented. He keeps us disoriented because as soon as you think that he's a political conservative, he'll say something that'll throw you. And as soon as you think he's a political liberal, he'll say something else. And you'll go, well, what? And he, he will go meet with the Pharisees. And the next chapter, he's going after the Pharisees. He's not schizophrenic, by the way. He's on purpose keeping us off step so that we can focus on him. It's where our hope is not based on our perfect understanding and our perfect grasp of all these things, but rather we're holding on to the one who is perfect and he's going to take us. He's going to, as Al said today, live with us. He won't let us feel safe and secure to where we can say, I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones because I've got the future all sorted. No, we rely upon him, not a comfort, not our categories, not a name outside of a building. Just real quick, I I did get a comment I noticed this morning on one of our videos that said, why did you guys name yourself Our Safe Harbor? I'll answer that one now, because we had to have a name. We had to have a name for the 501c3, and we had to have it now, and literally within a couple of hours. So I'm sitting there typing all kinds of names into the the search bar, and they're saying, nope, taken, nope, taken. I found one that, in fact, I I wanted just to say Safe Harbor. No, they're financial institutions by that name. That's why we're named that. What we are is Christians. We don't have a name outside the building. We don't have a building. We just want to emphasize this is a safe place to come. If you have questions and you want to know Jesus. But anyway, that's why we can now read the Bible and get more out of it. We have nothing to fear from it. We're locked into Jesus. When atheists rail against the Bible, they're railing against the genocides, the slavery, the war stories, the contradictions, the multivocality, as we called it. They cannot fathom how a reasonable modern person can worship a God like that. I know this because I work with atheists a lot, and they tell me, and I get it. They've confused God with the Bible, and there's, that's not their fault. A lot of Christians have too. And therefore, they spend a lot of their time dodging the stories that aren't good stories. Or trying to find a way of saying, well, you know, those people were really bad. That's why God had to kill the kids too. And we're going, did he though? Did he say that? Did he do that? We we'll spend the rest of our lives discerning between voices of humans and voices of God. And we're supposed to spend our life doing that. This is not going to be handed to us on a plate. My religion was pretty much handed to me on a plate. Again, that was not the intention of those who gave it to me. They were sincere, good people. They're saved. They're either in heaven or on their way. But it was handed to me as a leaflet with, we do this and here are all the scriptures. We do this, here are all the scriptures. And they were check, basically checklist, do this and you're in. You didn't have to do any of the work. It had been done for you and handed to you. But my church that I grew up in was not that unique. Isn't that true of other churches? Regardless of denomination, we walk in, we're handed, we're told this. 
God wants you to work on it. He wants you to notice. We spend so much time arguing about the bits and pieces, the, the contradictions, the moral quandaries, that we end up diluting the message of our Messiah to where he's no longer the Prince of Peace, but he also wages war on families. That he's not just the Prince of Peace, he brings disasters upon like the death of the firstborn in Egypt. There are a lot of kids that had nothing to do with that. They had not caused the problem. Do we, how do we explain that? Well, we can explain that Jesus taught us something different. And if you want an illustration of him teaching us something different, but also how we fail to notice, we can go to one of my, our, my favorite passages ever is in Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 14. He returns to Galilee. He is full of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit. That's very important that you get that. That's, that's in verse 14. He goes into Nazareth where he'd been brought up. On the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and a scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. Now, you know this passage, but did you ever notice something? Hang on. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. You know one of the reasons they were fastened on him? He didn't finish it. That's not the end of Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. I know you've got notes in your Bible, even if on your phone, and it will say that's Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Kind of. He proclaimed all of this good news, but he left out the last line to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. He didn't read that one. He shut the book. And we miss it because we don't know our Old Testament enough to know they didn't finish. And if Jesus didn't finish, there's a reason why. He brought peace, comfort, good news. He's not bringing vengeance. Look at Jesus. We can lose sight of Jesus and lose our Christian character when we try to defend the Bible, but we never lose when we defend the Christ our Bibles have brought us to. Our Bibles are precious and wonderful. Were they inspired by God? Absolutely they were. And they bring us to the one perfect being. Focus on him. We've gone over some of these, and I hope they don't, you know, some of the multivocality, the things said, and I hope they don't distress you too much. But I do want to, as we wrap this portion of our journey up. Uh, if you're wondering, next week, the sermon is really written by Bobby Hampton, our brother who's in death row. And he and I sat and they put us in a really tiny room. They normally don't put us in one this tiny. It was the tiniest one I've been in. About seven by four and a half concrete block room for four and a half hours. Uh, that's pretty intensive for an introvert who's also British. Um, it was yeah, but uh, after, after a while, I, I felt like the walls were closing in on me. But Brother Bobby, I asked him a question. How can you have faith in God when all of the appeals are gone and the new governors come in saying, it's time that we start killing the men on death row? How do you still have your joy? And he answered me. So that, next week is that sermon. After that, on the 25th, we start a new series called Hell, Heaven, and a God of Love. You're going to be challenged again. But it's going to be good news. There are many Christians who would be offended by what I've already said today. And they believe that all believers have said that this Bible is inerrant from the beginning of Scripture. But that's not true. The Jews knew of the contradictions in their scriptures and understood that they were there for a purpose, that humans were involved, merely showed our need for God to reveal himself more clearly. 
they, the Jews have had this scripture a long time. And you talk to any rabbi, and they know chapter 1 of Genesis, that story doesn't match with chapter 2. Does it bother them? No. Does it bother me? No. Because of the meta story that God's telling us, he's not doing a data dump and saying, read it, believe it, sign your name at the bottom, and we're all good. No. He said, ask, seek, knock, look for me, move. Have you ever wondered why the first home he gave them was a tent? We might say, well, it's because it was only supposed to be temporary. Yeah, but they were out there for 40 years. He said, keep moving, keep moving. And how he's kept us moving ever since. Early Christians believed what the Jews had taught them about the scripture. And that is that the Bible brings us to God, but God then has to reveal himself to us through it and through the community and through the spirit. Early Christians believed it until the rise of fundamentalism in the West, especially in America, but also in the United Kingdom. Then then the word inerrant began to mean something completely different. It began to mean what most people think it means today. However, and I hate to be one of those people that says it depends upon what is, is. But the fact is, the word is has many different perspectives built into it and we need to know what we're talking about when we say is and when we say inerrant are you aware that there are four different ways of meaning inerrant these are very openly taught in seminaries and when bible scholars get together or theologians get together and everybody knows where which group anybody is in That's why you will sometimes find a book, like I have a book on my desk right now, Four Views of Hell. And how would they get this from one book? Oh, it's easy. We've gotten thousands of denominations out of one book. It's easy to get four views. But all of these people writing in a book believe the Bible is inerrant. But there are four different ways. Now, here's where it also helps. We put these notes in the description for the video on YouTube. And you can download them for free. Nothing we do is copyrighted. Except for the songs. They retain their con- copyright. We pay for that. The, uh, the rest of it, use it. Say it's yours. <laughs> I've, had, I've, had, I've had people say, I'd like to use a couple things that you've said, but I'll quote you. I'll go, don't do that. No, because I, 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 everything I know about Jesus, I stole from four guys that wrote a book about him. So you just <laughs> go for it. Just take it. Um, I, I don't want to, so here we are, the four groups, absolute inerrantist, and that is a word, it's hard to see, they say the Bible is completely true in everything it says, including historical and scientific matters, they often have a God dictated every single word view of scripture, Uh, some of them actually believe that the writers go into some sort of a trance or have a vision when they write, most of them believe it's some form of a dictation. That said, it's a matter of faith to them that every perfect manuscript, or the original manuscripts were perfect in every single way. But that's also a matter of faith because we don't have any original manuscripts. So they're basing their absolute inerrantist stance upon something we have no evidence for. But let's move on. Full inerrantist say the Bible is completely true, even in matters of science and history. But they say the matters of science and history are true as they appeared to the observer and not as they would appear to a modern scientist or a modern historian. For example, in Leviticus chapter 11, the Bible divides clean and unclean animals. And one is you can eat anything that has you know, um, you know, he has to have a divided hoof and choose the good and this, that, and, you know, all the other. Well, then we come to rabbits and it says, well, even, you know, even though it chews the could and it moves on, rabbits don't chew a could. If you don't know what a could is, C-U-D, it means that you've got segmented stomachs. You've got more than one in there and that you're eating stuff that it's hard to get the nutrition from, like grass. And therefore, when you see a cow and it swallows... You can just be standing out there for a while. All of a sudden, you'll see this little movement. Those people on podcasts don't see the movement. It's like you're almost like you're burping, 
and then they start chewing, and you're going, wait a minute, they didn't get a bite. Yeah, they did. They just brought it back up, because you've got to make that journey several times to get the nutrient. Rabbits don't do that, but rabbits look like they do. And God wasn't requiring these people to be veterinarians and do autopsies. He was giving them information that looked like that to the observer. For example, the sun rose. Do we know the sun doesn't rise? Well, evidently nobody posting pictures on Facebook knows. Because they'll say, here's the sunrise, here's the sunset. We still use that language. Well, a full inerrantist says that when there are scientific or historical errors, it is because it looked like that to them. Does that help? And then limited inerrantists say the Bible is free from error, but only in reference to matters directly related to faith and salvation, not in science or history. So everything it teaches us about faith and our path to God is correct, but the others, not, maybe not. And then purpose inerrantist. I told you, you're going to need the notes on this. Believe the Bible is inerrant in purpose. They believe the Bible's purpose is to bring people into a relationship with Christ, not to communicate all truth about everything else. So, how would this work in practice? I knew you were going to ask. So, <laughs> absolute inerrantists read the first chapter of Genesis chapter 1, and they say, God spoke the heavens and earth and all that is into existence in six literal 24-hour days. Actually, even shorter than that, evening and morning. So, 12, 14 hours, whatever it was, uh, that that's literally it. And no matter what scientific measurements are done or observations are done, no, this is it. Full inerrantists say that God created the universe in six days. But they may not be literal 24-hour days. They might be ages, eons, long stretches of time, distinct eras. Limited inerrantists believe the question of the length of days or how God created everything is irrelevant. The important truth is the fact that there is a God, a God of order, and that God created everything and watches over everything, whether that took six days or whether it took billions of years. The purpose in Arantus would say the important truth of Genesis 1 is there is a God who speaks and can be known and who introduces himself to humanity. Well, how about another quick example? This will be quicker. Joshua chapter 10, verse 13. This one always fascinated me as a boy. It was not easy having a scientific mind in my family or church. And I was not allowed to speak or ask questions, but inside, it was like six pinball machines going off. In Genesis, uh, sorry, Joshua 10, verse 13, if you don't remember, there was a big battle going on. It's very, very important that they win this battle. And to win this battle, they needed daylight. Now, for those of you that watch movies, isn't it fascinating that even in the middle of the night, it's quite a well-lit meadow? Nights, fighting in the dark is, is a really awful, horrible thing. Therefore, they knew we have to finish this before it gets dark. So they prayed to God that the sun would stand still, and it did. Well, I can remember, I grew up in an absolute inerrantist church. The preacher saying, if God can make the universe, he can make it stop. And I'm going, well, that's, he could. He could. If he wanted to do that, he could. But that, and he, the preacher even said, even if it, it goes against the law of ten, uh, centrifugal force, you know, because if we stopped all of a sudden, all of us would be flying off toward Jupiter about now. Um, it, and Jupiter, by the way, would be flying off somewhere else. But I was thinking, it's a whole lot more than that. It would be the law of combustion. The law of surface tension, the law of, and I'm in all this in my head, and, go, and I'm having to smile and go, okay. Now, do I believe God can do it? Yes, yes. Do I believe he did that? No, because there's no reason to think that way. Um, by the way, limited in purpose in Arantists would say the story is to increase our faith, and to them, a, um, a full in Arantists would say, it looked like the day was being stretched out so they could win the battle. But the purpose was God helped them find a way to win the battle before it went dark. God was with them in the battle. We don't have to talk about 
a slamming shut of, of, the, of the universe. We can look at it through other eyes and say, thank God he helped them win the battle before it went dark. Have you ever, if you're thinking, but it said his son stood still. Have you ever noticed that happening in your life? This is not sarcastic. I have. I have been in classes where the clock would not move. And those of us who've read our Einstein, and I'm sure all of you, because I, I have, because I don't have that thing, um, a life. So I have. But you remember that Einstein actually taught us about the relativity of time, and he used an illustration, a second with your hand on a hot stove is eternity, but an hour with a pretty girl is a second. He had an eye, evidently. Um, if he'd only done more with his hair, maybe he'd had a shot. <laughs> but we've given you a couple of illustrations. There are many more. But here's the kicker. Most Christians were not absolute inheritance in history. And most still are not. They'll still explain away things. Trying to find a way to make this not an error. Only in some American Protestant churches do you find this doctrine. And guess what? They send missionaries out to teach it. In Africa, Southeast Asia, South America. And it pulls people's eyes away from God and away from Jesus. Because now they've got to work with a book that is presented as if the book is your Savior. The book brings you to your Savior. And we love our book. But we need to also treat it honestly. And handle it correctly, as Paul said. Always fascinating to me. Nobody in scripture said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's bumper sticker. That's not from heaven. So now what? What do we do? If we don't have a checklist, by the way, I normally don't have a checklist in my, um, in my life. I do have a list of things I got to get done that day. But it's free floating in there. My wife has a checklist. She's a very organized person. She gets it all done. Um, always on there somehow is look at Patrick and reconsider your choices. I don't know why that's it. But it's, everything else is there. We want a checklist in religion, don't we? We do. I want to know I pleased God at the end of this day. I want to know I'm safe at the end of this day. Let not your heart be troubled. Seek God. Focus on Christ. Ask, seek, and knock. And then pay attention to the book we've got. For example, that not reading that last line of the verse. Did you know that before? Pay attention to the book we've got. And it will lead you to Christ. And it will give you good news. As was read today, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Did you catch it? Verses 20 through 23. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. None of this is shocking, is it? We all, we've heard this. I think the next verse is shocking. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. How many people is God going to save? Now, immediately, some people are going, what about hell? I have found, and we'll talk about this in two weeks. You start trying to mess with people's hell, they get very upset. Because they are planning on some people being there. <laughs> and they, they want it sorted. We'll talk more. But are you aware? There are scores and scores of passages that say, eventually, all. Well, I do believe there is punishment. I do believe there is some reckoning. But all live? What about verses 24 through 28? The end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. He must reign until he's put his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Why did Jesus come to kill death? He went to the cross came back to show us, don't be afraid. He has authority over death. 
In fact, he has all authority. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. We all know the Great Commission when he said, go into all the world, teach them. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He didn't say all authority has been given unto me and to a bunch of books that later religious leaders will write about the book that I've given you. Go to Jesus. How about 1 Peter? And my, that section of my Bible is falling apart. Um, Cammy says, you want another one? It's hard to find giant print. Uh, that's my favorite version, uh, by the way, is giant print. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. He suffered for the unrighteous to bring you to God. He was put to death in a body, but made alive in a spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. But this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and who has gone into heaven at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. I had a friend who was a good man. Really, a good man. But he was always worried about hell. This man loved Jesus. This man did the checklist that his church had given him, and he did it with joy. And he gave, uh, he gave generously. Uh, he was not a man of means, but he gave generously anyway. And still he was worried that somehow he had fallen short of the perfection that God had called him to. And I said two things. Number one, God's never called you to be perfect. When the Bible says, be perfect as I am perfect, the word means complete, whole, made one. And so you're never going to be as perfect as Jesus. If you could be, you wouldn't have needed Jesus. We need Jesus. And the second thing, don't worry about hell because he's not going to let you go. Instead, why don't you start enjoying heaven now and make heaven now because part of our job we're never told in scripture ever be good and you'll go to heaven it's never told us what we're told is to be heaven here Matthew 25 feed the poor feed the hungry put some clothes on them visit the people in prison if they're sick go take care of them that's what God said he sees and then throws open the gates of heaven bring heaven down all right, these three remain, faith, hope, and what's the third? Love. love. And the greatest of these is? Love. love. And God is? Love. So be at peace. We have a Savior.